Uh, let's just get some left some leftover left leftover questions. There's one especially that I that I was looking for, and it it is uh, one one it's a trivia one, but it is rather interesting, and I can't find it. I've looked at it just a moment ago, and that is, what's the longest word in the Bible? And it says you don't have to answer this out loud, and I have no idea where that card went. Uh, uh, the longest word in the Bible, and how do you pronounce it? Well, uh, the longest word in the Bible. Are you ready for this? Mahershala Hashbaz. Okay, you got that? Uh, somebody knew that. I looked out there, and they shook their head yes whenever I said that. And, and, and that is remarkable. Mahershala Hashbaz is one of the sons of Isaiah. And I believe it's in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 1. Uh, uh, might as well go ahead, David, and put it on the screen if, that, if that's the, the, the right location of it so everybody can, uh, can see the longest word, uh, uh, lo the, the longest, longest word in the Bible. He's probably got it there before I get over there to it. So uh, there it is. Yes, Mahershala Hashbaz. And there's a reason he has this name, by the way. And all of the sons of Isaiah uh, they have a name and all of them have spiritual significance. In fact, it's in this very same chapter where, where Mahershala Hashbaz is, is given and, and, and mention is made in this chapter that the sons of Isaiah were signs to the people of Israel. And so whenever Isaiah has the, has the children, every name that he gives one of his children is a sign to the, to the people of Israel. And that's why he was given, uh, given that name. But that's, a, that's an interesting question, and it's one that we can answer rather, rather, rather quickly. Here's one that's a little bit more involved, and that is, if we quote 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 through 12, and 1 Corinthians 14, 37, and David, just hold 14, 37 for a moment. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through, uh, uh, 9 through 12, as our basis, then why doesn't verse 9 apply today regarding women wearing gold jewelry or braided hair? And, and there are some individuals be, because of, of the interest there is in this topic, and it's becoming more and more of interest in the church because people in this day and age will say, well, you need to understand that women are just as good as men, and I understand that. Women are just as smart as men, and I understand that. Women, may, women are smarter than men, and I question that. But, uh, but uh, uh, people are trying to find and negate what this verse says. Now, it's not verse 9 that, that is the problem. It's verse 12 that says, or verse 11, let, let a woman learn in, in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over the man but to be in silence. And that runs counter to everything that's in our culture. And you've got to understand that. And in this day of freedom and liberty and everybody having their own rights, it is, it is as though God never said anything about this matter. And so as you begin looking at this passage, you've got to understand that Paul, by the very Holy Spirit of God, says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over the man. Does that make sense? I'm not asking, do, do you agree with it? But do you understand the words? If, if, if you just... Here's, here's a document, and it says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over the man. Would you understand that? I believe you'd understand that the Holy Spirit of God said, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over the man. Look how many cards we're getting. That, that, that is remarkable. Uh, you understand that. When somebody says, well, I don't like that. Well, whether we like it or not doesn't negate what it says. If, if you'd been the recipient of this letter, if you'd been Timothy and you get this letter that says, I do not permit a woman to teach nor to have authority over the man, would you understand that? Well, yeah, I understand that. I don't particularly like it. And, and, and I may not understand the reasons of it. Well, look in the next couple of verses and you'll find two reasons. In verse 13 he says, here's one of the reasons that a woman cannot have authority over the man. For Adam was formed first, and then Eve. It has to do with the priority of creation. And then, particularly verse 14, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Lord, why don't you allow a woman to teach and have authority, have authority over the man? Here's the reason. It has to do with the priority of creation. It doesn't have anything to do with self-worth at all. It just says, 
If this is the way God wants. He created Adam, then He created Eve. First Corinthians chapter 11, he says they're interdependent. You couldn't have a man if you didn't have a mama. And that's the whole argument that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. They're interdependent. But in, the, in reference to creation, he says, here's one of the reasons you can't have women preachers. And that is, I do not suffer a woman to teach or have an authority over the man, but to, but to be in submission and, and to learn in silence. And so you read this verse, well, God, why would you say that? Well, he says, because in the creation and in the sin and the men falling away from God, Adam was not deceived. Eve was deceived. And the consequences, and as a reminder for all mankind hereafter that, about what happened there in the Garden of Eden, Eve, whenever that Satan said to her, you eat this fruit and you'll be as wise as God. She really believed that. She brought it to Adam and Adam ate of it. Guess what? Adam was not deceived. Why did Adam eat of it? Well, the only reason I can think of it, you may be able to think of another one. The only reason I can think of it is he did it because Eve talked him into it. Because Eve asked him to do it. You know, women sometimes have a way of asking men to do things, and they'll do some rather, rather, rather crazy thing just because, just because uh, uh, you know, just because some woman asked them to do that. And, 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 and that's what happened there. And God says, actions have consequences. And the same thing has to do with the matter of childbirth. Well, I don't think a woman ought to have the pain of childbirth. I think men ought to have the pain during the childbirth. And I just don't understand why a woman has the pain of childbirth. Well, go back to Genesis chapter 3. It is a reminder to what happened and the, and the consequence of sin. And, 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 and God has placed in this world things that are tied directly to that creation thing. So let's negate the fact that somebody says, well, I don't like it, and I, don't, and, you know, and I wish it were not that way, does not change what the Holy Spirit of God says. Now, the, the statement that is made, and by the way, this is a very legitimate question, then what about verse 9? Because verse 9 says, In like manner also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and mo moderation, not with braided hair of gold or of costly uh, clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. What does that say? Paul is talking about some things that are transpiring that are spiritual. Look back in verse 8. I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. He's talking about spiritual life. And, and what's, what's involved in, in the matter of, uh, of men praying everywhere? And by the way, this word man here is the masculine form. Earlier in this chapter, in the first seven verses of this chapter, it's mankind. It, it, it's, uh, it, the word is anthropos, which we anth anthropology from, it, just the study of, study, study of humans. And so it's mortals and it's mortals and it has to do with people. But all of a sudden he says, I want the men to pray lifting up holy hands. And he says, and in like manner. In like manner to what? What's he to, what, what, what is in, what, what is there in verse 9 that is in verse 8? It's the spirituality of that man. And he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And so it was the Jewish practice oftentimes whenever they would pray to lift up their hands toward God. Sometimes Jesus in the garden didn't lift up hands. It's not regulating the prayer but I'm telling you, by the way, let me just say this in passing. Lifting up holy hands is not this. I, I want you to understand that. You go to some of these denominational services, and it's like a wave that's going on, uh, you know, at a football arena. And by the way, it's the women who are doing it far more than men. I went to a funeral recently. I've got, somebody said, well, I'm, I was watching you at this funeral. Well, I was watching the women because it was the women doing, doing all this holy hands lifting or, or doing the holy wave. That's not what this verse is talking about. He's talking about the sobriety of what happens when we come to the presence of God. And he says, I desire that men pray, and I want holy men to pray. And then he says, in like manner. What about the women? The what about the women is found in verse 10, verse 10 when it says, women who are professing godliness. And the word godliness in verse 10 is parallel to the holy hands. That's the like manner. Well, what would be the opposite? 
What would be the opposite of an individual praying, or, or of a man praying, the opposite of what's stated, and that is a man praying with unholy hands. And he's purporting himself to be a, 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 a righteous individual, but his life is unholy. So he's doing a religious thing without, without holiness. He's adorned in the wrong way. The adornment of the man in this passage is the holiness of his life. And he says to the women, in like manner, women need to adorn themselves with holiness. And we have to understand that because, you see, it would be so easy for a woman without any regard for holiness to, to think that she is pleasing before God whenever she comes before God and, and she uh, uh, finds her beauty in the wearing of gold and things of that nature. This verse does apply today. It applies today in exactly the same way it applied in the first century. And that is, godliness comes not from outward apparel. Godliness comes from within the heart. The man leading the prayer has a holy heart. He lifts up holy hands. And the woman in this passage is holy, not because of the garments that she has on, but she is holy because of the godliness that is in that that is in her that is in her heart. You got a parallel situation over over in First Timothy, uh, chapter three. First, first, pardon me. First Peter chapter three. Uh, David, if you'll put this one up there. First Peter chapter three, uh, verse three. Do not let your adornment, talking to the women, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or the putting on of fine apparel. You, you, you see that? Do you notice anything uh, uh, unusual uh, uh, about that in 1 Peter chapter 3? Uh, you'll have to pick up the pew Bible to see, what, to see the point that, I, that, that is being made here. The, the New King James, and the, and, the, and the one that I have, and I hope it's the same way in, in the Pew Bible, whenever he says in verse 3, do not let your adornment be merely outward. You see the word merely? It's in italics. You'll pick up a Pew Bible. What does that mean? The word is not in the tongue, not, not, in, not, in, the original, not in the original text. And he says, do not let it be outward, the putting on of, uh, of wearing of gold, or the putting on and take the word fine out. Because that word is not in the original. If 1 Timothy chapter 2 forbids the wearing of gold, listen to this, because it says, Whose adornment let it not be with gold and the braiding of hair and everything. If that forbids the wearing of gold, then 1 Peter chapter 3, chapter 3 verse 3 forbids the wearing of any apparel at all. Because the word fine there is not in the original language. And so it says, don't let your adornment be the putting on of apparel. And so some individuals, and some individuals say a woman couldn't wear a gold wedding ring or things of that nature, couldn't wear anything gold because the Bible forbids it. Well, that's because that passage is taking out of context. And the context in which it's found is the matter of the holiness of the heart of the individual who is leading in prayer. Uh, let's say 1 Corinthians 14 43 about it's not permitted to women to speak in the assembly. You've got to understand how emphatically that, well, we may as well put, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse, uh, verse is it verse 34? That's the verse that is, that is on the card where, where Paul says, let your women keep silence in the church. It doesn't sound like, uh, let your women keep silence in the church. For it, verse 34, let your women keep silence in the church, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as the law states. And you've got to understand that here's the Holy Spirit of God saying that in the assembly, when the whole church comes together in the one place, when they are in the church, you cannot have a woman speaking. You cannot have a woman preacher. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, well, somebody said that's just cultural. That's just the way it was in the first century. That's true. That is the way it was in the first century because that's what the book says. I'm glad you understand that. But look at verse 37 that says, or verse 38 that says, uh, 37, if anyone think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, 
let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are just cultural, and in the 21st century you can just ignore everything that God says. Uh, that's not the way mine reads. Paul says, the things I write unto you are the commandment of the Lord. And that has nothing at all to do with self-worth. It has to do with the realization of things that happen in, the, in biblical times and the results of those things that happen at that time. Let's get to some of tonight's questions. But there are some really, really good leftover questions here that, that are really fascinating. How many times is the word Jesus said in the Bible? Uh, David, if you'll look that up and just put that on the screen, you can do that a whole lot quicker than I can. I, uh, it, it's, a, it's really remarkable. The matter of computers, some of you can take your smartphone right now and find out how many times the word Jesus is found in the Bible. I've done that in reference to the word God, and I hope by now David has almost got that up there. How many times is, is the word Jesus found in the Bible? And, and at one time you have to manually count it. I remember my early preaching, somebody saying, well, this word is found, you know, 14 times in the Bible. And I was working on a sermon, and I thought, that sounds so great. And so I took out my big concordance, and it was used 72 times, and I miscounted. So I had counted it again, and it was either 73 or 71. I mean, if just uh, trying to fish it. Computers are great because you can just uh, ask that question, and it's found 980 times uh, in the Bible. Uh, I, I, I don't know what's the worth of knowing that. I don't think that's on the final test to get into heaven, but it's fascinating, about as fascinating as Mahershala Hashbaz. All right, here's the next one. Oh, boy. That, that, one, that one is so complicated. We'll save that one to later. Um, how does the, the empty clatter or babblings now in 2 Timothy 2.16 in regard to to our Christian, Christian conversion. 2 Timothy 2.16, um, don't know what it says. Uh, I'm not sure what translation this is. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you'll put verse 14 through... Uh, through verse 17, David, put those on the board. Remind them of these things. Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, You charge them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of, he, of, of the hearers. Sometimes you, there, there are situations that we get involved in where we, where we get so concerned about things that are incidental that we don't see the big picture. And that was so characteristic of the Jews. Uh, in, in, in a philosophical way, there's writing in early church history about how many angels could stand on the point of a needle. Uh, David, would you look that up? <laughs> Seriously, it was a theological question. How many angels could stand on the point of a needle? The Bible doesn't discuss that. And yet that, was a, that is a striving about words. I think I've told this story once before. And uh, uh, let me go ahead and tell it again. When I was a younger preacher, I thought I was going to really be great. And uh, uh, I'd been preaching well uh, at the same congregation, the second congregation I preached at, the full-time sort of, just on the weekends. And, uh, and so in a Sunday night sermon, I gave to uh, one of the men in the church a question. And I said, when I say this word, stand up and interrupt my sermon and ask this question. And so I, I said, it's good to have everybody here, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden I said that key word, and the man stood up and he said, Dan, I could I ask you a Bible question? He had it written down there. I knew everything that was going to happen. And, 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 it, and so when I got to the end of that question, uh, I hit another key word and another brother in another part of the auditorium stood up and said, Dan, can I ask you a question? And that plan was really, really great because I had three questions. The problem was we had a man in the church who thought it was a question night and he stood up and I had the fourth question that was asked. And I will never forget the question. Could God make a rock big enough 
Is God powerful enough to make a rock big enough that even God could not move it? And the Bible answer to that is, foolish and unlearned questions avoid. <laughs> and, I, and, and that's what came to my mind. So I answered uh, Floyd. I remember, I remember, I said, Floyd, Paul talks about that very question. Foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Now let's get back to the lesson. You know, it's, it's, it's the question, could something be black and white at the same time? You, you understand, it, 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 you, you maneuver words, they're called intrinsic impossibilities. And people sometimes get involved in that. And so Paul is writing to tip Timothy to stay focused in his life. And he says, now you be diligent to present yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblers. Have you ever met anybody that just wanted to talk to you about the Bible and had no interest at all? Every now and then you'll run, run, run across some individual. That sometimes they're, 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 they're rather arrogant, rather puffed up about some little verse they know about the Bible, and it's not a Bible study at all. It's just they just want to go on and on about something that they know, something that is of great worth and are in their mind and great consequences to them. And uh, you run across them uh, 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 rather often. Uh, David and I have had the same man that's called us uh, at various times, and I think the next time he comes, we'll just give him to Josh. Just don't tell Josh about it. But, but, the, but the, the man is so wrapped up in thinking he knows everything about, everything about everything. And you can't get a word in edgewise. Idle babbling. And we've illustrated some of those things like the rock that's too big. So even God could not, you know, uh, could, uh, even God himself could not move it. But there are sometimes people who get so involved, perhaps because knowledge does puff up, they, they find some little thing and, and they, they'll disrupt sometimes even the progress of the church. And so Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you get inside the Word and you study the Word of God and you know the Word of God. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that does not be, need to be ashamed because you handle the Word of God in the right way. But there are some who will not. And if you've been involved in discussion with a lot of people, every now and then you'll run across an individual who is almost agnostic, who, who, who thinks that he's, he's able to find something and destroy the faith of others. And, and Paul says, you avoid that. Uh, and so that's what's involved in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 mentions musical instruments. Why don't we use them now? Well, one, one of the reasons is we're not in heaven. Uh, if, you, if you'll understand that, we've got to, underst uh, got to understand if, 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 if our imagination of heaven is, is such that, I, I don't know how to say this, how do you describe that which is indescribable except to use words that everybody can grab a hold of and understand? There was one of the questions that was, that was uh, turned in about, in my father's house are many rooms uh, in, in John chapter 14. And one of the questions we did not get to tonight, and what's the meaning of this? Well, do you really expect to, when you get to heaven, there's going to be a condo situation that you'll have an elevator to ride up, down, on, and, 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 and everybody has their little own apartments. Jesus was trying in the most graphic way to give people an imagination and an, and an understanding of the fact that that, that that place is so wonderful. And there are many mansions that are there. The old King James uses the many mansions. There are many mansions there, not many rooms, there are many mansions there. And Jesus uses language that we're able to understand. It's sort of like the fire of hell. What's hell like? Well, it's fire. But wait a minute. Fire always produces light. So it can't be literal fire. 
because fire produces light and heaven is a place of outer darkness. Not just dark, but way out in the outer darkness. And, and the Lord is trying to graphically describe that which there, there's just no words to describe. It's somewhat like the pearly gates and the streets of gold. I'm not going to be disappointed when I get to heaven if there are no gold streets. I believe God's got something far better in mind of heaven than gold streets. But the only way He can describe it is to describe it in that way. And so in the book of Revelation, in a book that is filled with that which is symbolic, there is this praise of God that is, that, that, that is going on. And so verse 8 says, He takes the scroll and the four living creatures fall down before the Lord, each having a harp, harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So if this verse is, is talking about Christian worship, then here's the very verse that would demand that we have the burning of incense. Because you see, in heaven they have, they have incense. But John is trying to describe in a, a vision that he saw of heaven. And a vision has within it things that represent something far more greater than the very thing that is seen in the vision. You remember in, in Acts chapter 10, when Peter's on the housetop praying, and, and there's a bed sheet that comes down, and inside that bed sheet are unclean animals. And God says to Peter, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And I think it's remarkable. Peter is very much like he was when Jesus is on the earth. He's got an opinion about everything. And he said, Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And the bed sheet comes down again, and it comes down a third time. And, and, and he sees this vision, and, and the Lord says, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, Not so, Lord. And then, the, then the, the bed she's taken up into heaven. And when he gets up into heaven, he's trying to figure out what's going on. What's this all about? Well, when he gets over to the household of Cornelius, the Gentiles, he says, God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. You see, the vision that was there was that which represented something far greater than the literal description that is involved in that. And, and the danger that we sometimes get into in relationship to uh, the book of Revelation, and, and, and the answering of this question is somewhat a part of that, is that we try to look in that and make everything literal and find some significance in relationship, uh, in, in relationship to all of these things. Well, let me ask you something. Peter says, I was very hungry and I wanted to eat when he's on the housetop. And while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Uh, 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 David, just put Acts chapter 10, verse, uh, ver verse 9 through, through 16. He goes up the six hours, about noontime. He's very hungry and he saw the heavens open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descended to him and let down to the earth. And in it were all kinds of four-footed beasts. And some people will come to this and they'll read this and they'll try to get a, some, something symbolic meaning. Inside that, because we know unclean animals were camels, wonder what those camels represented. And there's some pigs inside there. Wonder who those pigs represent. They don't represent anything. It's a vision of what he saw and, and, and by they don't represent anything. They're just talking about people. I should not call any man common or unclean. Peter understands that. But people will say, come to the book, of, the book of Revelation and they'll come to this very thing and they'll say, wonder what kind of knot. Was, it's knotted in the four corners. Wonder what kind of knot it had in it. And somebody who, know, who, who knows knots will say, well, they're sailor's knots and they're hard knots and they're all these different kinds. I wonder what kind of knot it was. It's just a vision. And John on the Isle of Patmos says, he showed me things 
in symbols. What are the symbols of the thing that's happening in heaven? The bowls symbolize not authority to be used in worship to the burning of incense. The bowls represent the prayers of the saints, and that very thing is stated. Now, if you were going to describe to individuals who in the Old Testament had seen harps again and again, in fact, in the very Old Testament, there's the, there's the presence of harps. There's David playing on the harp, a man after God's own heart play, playing on the harps. And there, the, there is that reference. And if you wanted to symbolize praise, how else could you better express it than to say, and I saw in heaven all of these individuals praising God on harps. Because that, that's exactly what was happening. Now having said all of that, there are harps in the Old Testament. There in, is in this book of Revelation, figured, a, a book that's highly figurative, a description of harps in heaven. Do you know what is absent? What's missing is harps in the church. You've got to understand the difference. Are you aware there are horses in the Old Testament? And are you aware there are horses in heaven? And it's because there are horses in heaven, then let's have a hallelujah, hallelujah time next Sunday night, and let's bring all the Shetland ponies and all the big horses and the Clydesdale and all the rest, and let's just bring the horses because they're in the book of Revelation. Let's bring them into our assembly. Why would I, if I'm trying to find out how I ought to praise God, why, why would I go back and ask, how did they do it in, in Old Testament times? And why would, I, why would I read about what's in heaven? It is not that harps are evil. Harps are not authorized. If you'd been in the first century church, the Bible says, make melody in your heart to the Lord. I want you, I want you to understand that. David put Ephesians 5, 19 and, and Colossians uh, uh, 3, 3, 16 on the board. He say, he's talking about, here's, here's what is involved in our worship. Verse 16 let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Here's a man that's got a harp. And he's over here plucking a harp. Is he doing what this verse says? What does this verse say? In the assembly, let Christ's words be in you, and you teach and admonish one another. Playing a harp, is that teaching and admonishing one another? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You and I need to understand that we are singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. And so an individual has a harp and they do some sort of, sort of con concert and everything that is involved in that, how much of this verse has been fulfilled? How much singing has there been? How much speaking to one another? How much is involved in this? Here's, here, you know, here's the musical notes that might come out of a harp. And they may sound melodious to us, but that's not what's involved in this. Look at, especially at Ephesians 5, 19 where the Bible says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And so when it comes time to worship, what do I do? I take my heart, H-E-A-R-T, and I pluck the strings of my heart unto the Lord. Now, look 
Psalm 33, verse 2. It's interesting to look at the parallel between Ephesians 5, 19, and, and uh, just leave that one on the board, and look at Psalms 33, verse 2. Because here we have the statement, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It's Psalms 33, verse 2, yes. Praise the Lord with a harp. Make melody to Him with an instrument of ten strings. Now, if that were found in Christian worship, and I, I want to find authority in Christian worship, what would I have to do to fulfill this? I would have to take a harp, at least something that has ten strings, and in order to fulfill the commandment of God, I would have to make melody with a harp, H-A-R-P. Authorized in the Old Testament? Absolutely. What's authorized in the New Testament? Making melody in your heart, H-E-A-R-T. And there's a world of difference between some instrument that cannot speak, that has nothing at all to do with the fulfillment of speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, has nothing at all to do with that with an instrument. Because singing in worship has to do with the matter of using words to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs uh, 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 unto the Lord. Well, let's get back to, to the next question. And is that one I've just answered? That one I've answered. I've got the two questions from the two weeks combined here. Well, here's this must be the current ones right here, yes. Question. What is the difference in the laying on of hands to receive the Holy Spirit and being baptized to receive the Holy Spirit? There's a world of difference in the two. You and I need to understand. That, that there was that which came through the laying on of hands. Look in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, we read of those individuals in Samaria in beginning in verse 12. Put 12 through 21 or 22 on the, on the screen. Acts 8, 12 says... They believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, both men and women, and were baptized. Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Philip had gone to a place where the gospel had never been preached. And when he arrived at that place where the gospel was preached, he was fulfilling the commandments of the Lord. The Lord had said, go make disciples of all nations. The Lord had said, you baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? If I'm baptized, and the Greek says, into the name of the Father and into the name of the Son and into the name of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? I'm in the world. And now when I'm baptized, I bring, I'm brought into a new relationship to the Father. I'm brought into a new relationship to the Son. I'm brought into a new relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so when I'm baptized, when you take somebody and they're, they're, that before they're baptized, they don't have the relationship to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And so you baptize them into a new relationship. What is their new relationship to the Father? They're now a child of God. That relationship has changed. In the world and now they're in a relationship with the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism is not baptism into the name of Jesus. 
Baptism is in the name of Jesus. Different word. Not into, but in. And when you do something in the name of another, it is by His authority. And so the Bible says, He preached unto them concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, both men and women, and they're baptized. And He mentions in verse 13, a man by the name of Simon. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them who when he was come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not fallen on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. They'd been baptized because Jesus said it. When you do something in the name of another, you do it by his authority. And what had happened in Samaria was they had been baptized by the authority of Jesus. That's why Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. That's why Acts chapter 19 says, He commanded them to be baptized in, in, the, in the name of the Lord Jesus. So that's what had happened there. They'd gone up there, and by the authority of Jesus, they had baptized them. Now, when they were baptized, they had a new relationship to the Father. They had a new relationship with the, with the Son, and they had a new relationship with the Father. But look what he stated. They had not yet received the Holy Spirit. That's something totally different. When they were baptized, they were baptized into a relationship with the Father and into a relationship with the Son and into a, to a relationship with the Holy Spirit. But they had not received the Spirit. So what happens? And that's what the question says. What is the difference between receiving the Spirit and what happens when you're baptized? Well, here is the difference. They sent unto them Peter and John, who when they came down, verse 15, prayed for them that they might receive the Spirit, for they hadn't received the Spirit. They laid their hands on them, and they received the Spirit. You look at other parallel usages of this. We don't have time to do it right now. But when the apostles laid hands on individuals, they received miraculous gifts. Acts chapter 19, they laid their hands on them and they began to speak with tongues. And so here is the thing that was happening. The apostles laid hands on them and they were receiving the Spirit and it was manifested. Simon did not hear that they had received the Spirit. Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Spirit was given. He offered them money saying, Give me this power also that on anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Spirit. How does the, what does the Bible, how does the Bible use the expression, receive the Spirit? Without an exception that I am aware of, it always uniformly refers to what happens when the apostles' hands were laid on individuals. And the proof of that is, Acts chapter 8, and, and these verses in the, you know, verses 14, 15, and 16. If one receives the Spirit when they're baptized, and that's, and, and that's what some individuals say, instead of saying they're baptized into the Father and into the Son and into the Spirit, they receive the Spirit when they're baptized. This passage makes no sense at all. If one receives the Spirit when they're baptized, and these had not yet received the Spirit, had they received the Spirit or not? The Holy Spirit says they had not received the Spirit. Did they have a new relationship with the Spirit? Absolutely. Matthew 28, 19 says they had a new relationship with the Spirit. But they had not received the Spirit until the apostles' hands were laid on them. So that's the difference between those two. I'm sure that'll, there'll be some other questions that'll come in about that, so let's just, let's just uh, 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 leave that where it is and deal with that, some other questions that might come out of that. I don't know about you, I love First Sunday Nights. I really, really love First Sunday Nights, and, and I've got this many questions. I don't know what to do with them. 
I really don't know what to do with it. I've thought about putting all the questions on the board here and let you, those of you who have a smartphone send a text message to David and let you decide which question I ask, ask, ask next. I don't know if that'd be a fun thing to do or not uh, because us old folks that don't have smartphones, uh, we'd be left out. But I just think it'd be really interesting to find what questions that, that you, might, you might find interested in relationship. Would you verbalize to me uh, how you would feel about doing something like that just to decide of all of these questions. There's so many questions I've got that, that are not answered. I've answered about seven of them, six or seven of them tonight. And uh, what do we do with those that are leftovers? In Bible study fun, isn't it great just to open it up and say, what's this verse mean? And I love the way you listened on, on, on uh, first Sunday nights. And I love the comments that come as a result of, of first Sunday night uh, uh, things that, that are there. Bible study is great. Let's be students of the Word and limit ourselves to what God says and be willing to, to, to leave it at that, very, at that very place. Now we come to that part of our service where it may be that you've decided to become a Christian, that you want to be because you believe in Jesus, and you want to have a relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that you've made up your mind. And that making up your mind is called repentance. And if you've repented and you're repenting right now, think, I'm going to obey the gospel tonight, then this very night you could be baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of all of your sin. That's wonderful. Invitation song says that, that that's the time when that can happen. If you're an unfaithful Christian, you need to come back to the Lord, or if, however this church can help you. Won't, it, won't you let it be known right now by coming to the front right now? As together we stand and sing. Will you come?